just try it. Like it just, it feels good. I'm going to uh, request that you remove all copy from your website. And the only quote that's on the top is, it just feels good. <laughs> <laughs> it just feels good. Download now. The future of music. 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 The future of music podcast. Hey there, once again. We are here. It is time. I'm spinning. My seat won't won't stay straight. Uh, in any event, we're here. Ryan Withrow, Jonathan Boyd with the Future of Music podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive both in the future of music. And today is no exception, my friend. John, first of all, I, I love seeing you and I love what we got planned for today. So let's talk about what we have planned today because it's it's a big one. It's one that's been in the works for probably like two months straight. So let's do it. Been in the works. I think today will probably be some of the most interesting combination of things that we've talked about on the podcast as a whole, all coming together into one package, into something that's actually blowing up. In the real world, all of our predictions are coming together, going from nothing in two years to being featured in commercials on NFL, you know, football network, things like that. And I will just leave it there. And if you are interested at all in AR, VR, the future of music, digital instruments, how learning music is going to be easier in the future, you definitely, definitely want to listen to this entire episode. Darn straight. And, you know, if you just enjoy Ohio in the Midwest, uh, you know, that's another inclination there. But also make sure you like, you subscribe. You also click the alerts so you're alerted to every one of these wonderful episodes that we do just for you. Also, make sure that you follow on your favorite podcast platform. But John, yeah, I, I think a few months ago, I, I really started looking into this specific company, this specific application that we're going to be talking about today and the amount of growth I have seen, not just with this organization itself, but within the communities that use it, mm -hmm. it's just insane. It, it, I remember being on uh, out in, in downtown, watching a game, an NFL game, and seeing a commercial for this and being like, well, it's growing that fast so yep. quickly. And today we've got the founder of Piano Vision. I'm sure that you, you have no idea what that is, considering we talk about it so much. Uh, but it's a big deal for us. We have been nerding out so much on Piano Vision and the mixed reality ability to learn music and music education. So today we welcome Zach Reed, the founder of Piano Vision. All right. As you can see, we, we are actually joined by somebody else. It's not just John and myself. I mean, just uh, John. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, sometimes, uh, okay, sometimes, fine, you know, we could, we could both be just sometimes, fair enough. uh, you know, it's fine. It depends on if I showered or not mostly, but in any event, we, we've got a guest today. I, I am just going to go past that. We've got Zach Reed, uh, and Zach, my friend, we have been in touch for a minute, uh, trying to get you on here. It's almost like you're busy or something. It's almost, it's almost like you have a few things happening in your life. Uh, that may be taking time. Uh, I don't believe any of it, but I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I just, first and foremost, uh, I think we've talked about Piano Vision on the podcast at least 814 times. Uh, yep. yeah, really, I'm not kidding. We did an entire episode dedicated to finding the platform and really diving into it and getting excited about it. And I think I just randomly reached out to y'all like six months ago. And I was like, you got to come on. Like, we, we have to have a conversation. And you, you did it. So good on you. Uh, uh, we, appreciate, we appreciate it. It's the Ohio coming out. Uh, but yeah, I'm really honored to have you here. We're really excited to talk about stuff. For those of you that don't know, I'll make sure that we link the previous episodes about Piano Vision as well. So you have those. And just to give the high level, what would you say? Just like Piano Vision is uh, a Quest application that allows you to tackle piano learning in mixed reality and yeah. with like hand tracking and everything, right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much right. Yeah. Nailed it. Nailed, uh, pretty much isn't nailed it, but I just took it. Uh, I just went for it. But yeah, man, welcome to the Future Hi. of Music yeah. podcast. Uh, we're we're really excited. Thank you. Thank you. Man, it's been a crazy, what, year for you or something. I, I don't even know at this point. It's booming. But let's, I kind of want to like 
backtrack a little first. All right. I don't want us to go like right into the massive amount of, of insane success that I see in commercials for the quest at this point, but I'd rather start talking with you and, yeah. and learning a little bit more about you because obviously to get this idea and this concept of piano vision, it didn't just like, you didn't roll over one day and go like, I'm going to code something. Uh, so I'd love to kind of hear an overview of kind of your bio in that way. Yeah. What led yeah. you to this point of being like, I need to make this thing. Right. Uh, so I like, I'm traditionally, traditionally not really like a piano player. Like I studied it like a little bit in school and like, you know, music classes and I, you know, tweaked with it around. I had a keyboard, um, but I'm more of a coder. I like building things a lot. And, but I, you know, I wanted, I wanted to know how to play the piano. I just didn't have training. I didn't have like the focused time to sit down and learn properly. Um, Back in 2014 or so, uh, I was working in a research lab and we got the Oculus Dev Kit 1. And I was working on some research, research experiments. Um, so that, that was my introduction into VR. And I was I could feel it was really early. I didn't think it was really ready. So I kept working on small VR projects on the side um, as I was like working as a software engineer out in uh, the Bay Area. And then in like 2017 or 2018, um, the Microsoft HoloLens came out which is like, it's crazy it was so long ago and how impressive it was at the time, but it's just this amazing true AR device that can run all these spatial apps and like a, a truly like the first like spatial computing platform. And I swear it was one of those things where like I put the headset on and the, I, I had a, a keyboard in the corner of my eye and I saw it and I was like, oh my God, okay, this would just be insane just thinking of like the synchronicity between a person and the piano through whatever visuals you could add on to it. And I played around with it back then a little bit, uh, some small concepts, but the field of view on it was really small. So you couldn't really see the whole keyboard and it was pretty limited. Also, it was really, really expensive. It was on at the time, I think it was about what the Vision Pro is right now, like 3,500 or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I kind of put it on the back burner and I thought, okay, whenever augmented reality comes about, like th this is going to be the idea I work on because I, I want it to train, I want to build it so that it can train me to play piano better. Mm -hmm. um, so then I'm working as a, a software engineer, uh, building some VR apps on the side. And then Meta uh, announces for the Quest 2 that they were going to enable pass through for developers. And I was like, OK, this is this is the moment. This is like the time when they're at the time, I think probably 15 million or so Quest 2s out in circulation. Like this is the first augmented reality, mixed reality moment that was actually like massive in consumer. It was black and white and grainy, but it was clear that that was a direction that they were going to go in and keep improving. Mm -hmm. um, so like within months of them announcing that, um, I like quit my job and I just started working on Piano Vision full time. Um, just because I knew I like I know like, and even today, like, you know, we're, we've, we've gotten really far, but just like closing my eyes and envis envisioning what the optimal interface would look like visually between a person and the piano, it's like we've gone far, but we're still not even close to what it can be. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll build it. People will find it valuable. I'll find it valuable and I'll just keep building it in the direction that it adds value for me. And I'm sure other people will feel the same way. And that's, mm. that's kind of how it all went. Uh, just a short little story. Yeah. 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 Just, just a <laughs> small little happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what I love about that is it's, I, I hesitate to use the term success story, but I mean, I think anybody looking on the outside would say that's exactly what it is. But what I like about this is you're illustrating the common journey of success that anybody who's successful goes through. It's not just like Ryan said, you didn't just wake up one day and then boom, here it is. You coded it. And then here we are meta commercials. It just doesn't work that way. So I love seeing that process behind everything. So thank you for sharing uh, that with us. Something I'm interested in to hear from you is you talk about this idea of music as a language. And you also mentioned that it sounds like you created this in the beginning to solve your own problem, but you saw a commercial application for it, maybe that other people could use it, right? Which went hand in hand with the development of AR in this case. Yep. So when you, when you were developing this for yourself to solve your own problem, you said you weren't traditionally trained as a musician. Can you talk a little bit about what does it mean to you when you when you were trying to bridge the gap between, well, I didn't learn that way or the proper way. And then you talk about music as a language. So can you talk about what's the connection there? Yeah. Uh, 
I think I, I have some ideas that I, I, uh, I'm, I'm somewhat hesitant to share because I'm not traditional. I know a lot of traditional people get, I've seen it in the comments. People get kind of fired up about learning in a different That's way. That's good. We want to fire them up. Let's fire uh, them up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, pour pants on. Let's go. Okay. I, I know sheet music's been around for a really long time. I know a lot of people really love it. And I know at the current moment, you can communicate a lot more information about music and playing music with it. I, I don't think that has to be the way forever. Like, I think the falling note system, it's people are like, oh, you should just learn to read music, but it's another form of reading, right? Like it, it, for people who are like, for people who say, you know, you put on the headset and you're playing and you're just like looking at the notes. It's like, well, what about sight readers who, who have to look at the sheet, right? It's like, it's a, it's just a different form of reading. Um, and if you ask like tons of piano, like pretty much any piano teacher or people in piano education, what one of the biggest problems is it's you like his horrible retention because people like kids, especially as attention spans are getting smaller, they really don't like sitting down and learning to read sheet music in the pace of playing something that they actually find interesting. It's just so slow for sheet music for a large like majority of people. Um, and is that sad? Sure. I mean, maybe it is, but it's a reality of like the modern day is that like there, we're seeing less and less people learn piano because of, like, I guess the attention economy, I don't know what exactly what it is. Um, so I, at, at the very least, I feel like we're servicing that set of people to, I don't know what exactly what the numbers are, but servicing the set of people who would never be, uh, have a relationship with the piano and mm -hmm. helping bridge that connection. So you get to a point where you're feeling music, musical, you're feeling the music come out of your hands and yeah, like it doesn't it doesn't have to be sheet music. I mean, we we support it in the app, and I, I and we're working on like a course so that you can bridge the gap, so you learn to feel comfortable with the piano, and then you learn sheet music, and you can you know jump back to the traditional way if that's the path you think is right. Um, but yeah, it's just a language. Like you know, it's like it's this digital instrument. Like every key is just it's like a binary thing, and so it's like. How do you, when you learn from reading sheet music or you, or you learn traditionally, you're like, you're just mapping your brain out in a certain way. And then when you're learning from the following note system, it's very, it's just another way of mapping it to getting the same result. Yeah. So what I love about that is this is actually something that we've been talking about for years. And if you, which, you know, I'm sure you won't, but if you go back and look at the previous episodes, we talk consistently about these themes that we see coming true. And also the the um, the principles behind the themes. Some of the themes are just like what we're talking about here. Piano vision is a software instrument in, in a way. I'm just it, that's I'm paraphrasing, but it's a way to learn this skill or learn this language with a different quote instrument that didn't exist previously. And yeah, these like are that. some of the things that we predict continuing to happen. And it feels like almost every week, Ryan, we get on and like, hey, you know, remember that thing we talked about two years ago? Here it is. Um, but we talk a lot about the idea that music is a language. And I always say that any musician, any musician that can play multiple instruments knows that it's just a language that you communicate behind all of the instruments. Whereas the general population thinks that, oh, I'm not musical because I don't know how to read music or I don't know how to play right. the traditional guitar or do this other thing. But all real musicians know that music is behind all of that. It's underneath all of that. And just like we sh we're speaking English right now, so I can use different instruments to communicate in English. I can use my mouth. I can type. I can write with a pen. They're all different instruments. So what I love about what you're doing is exactly what we're working on as well. And it's kind of the same approach that we take with uh, with Breakthrough Guitar that we run, you know, uh, separately from this podcast, which is kind of breaking all of the rules and and saying that like, look focus on this little thing that allows you to be creative and play actual music. Don't worry about trying to learn this scale and that scale and, and this other thing or whatever, because it doesn't matter at the end of the day, what matters is communicating. So, and what you're doing is exactly that. It's allowing people to communicate in the language of music. And I love that. I love that too. That's exactly, that's, I speak to exactly how I feel about it. Um, it's just like, for I, I think of for like, for every person who plays and is able to play some songs that they enjoy or that they that if they have that connection that they would never have otherwise that's like such a benefit such a net benefit regardless of anything else like that's just that gives me the most happiness knowing that there's people i, I see comments all the time like 
never thought I'd be ever be able to play. This is amazing. I feel so emotional. And it's like, that's what really, really drives me. It feels so good to. I, I, was just, I was just about to say the exact same thing. The idea that people are out there and they think they're not musical. They think they can't do it. And you show them yeah. one little thing that they're like, they're like, oh my gosh, I can do this. I can play with the songs that I like or whatever. That, it's the same driving factor for me. Um, but Ryan, I'm curious to hear what you think about this general conversation about music being a language. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, as, as you know, from talking as much as we have on these podcasts, I think there's this curve. Uh, and I think what you're seeing is like the beginning of that curve with some people, right? And it's like, you have this journey in music and becoming a musician. If you go the proper traditional way, uh, like John and I often say, unfortunately did, because uh, it, it was long and hard, uh, a lot more complex than it needed to be. Um, you kind of start with this like, you know, okay, yeah, no, music, sheet music, like nothing else, scales, harmonies, you got to learn it all. And if you don't, screw you, you know? Uh, and I think at the end of the day, you get to this point at the end of that curve uh, and all those years where you're like, man, if I could have only just like skipped to where I'm at right now, instead of doing five years of, of a college degree to, to understand music theory and composition, that would have been cool uh, to do that. And I also talk about this a lot. We run into as people who are classically trained uh, in, in an instrument we instantly have walls and barriers when we're going out and trying to be creative and trying to do something new or trying to write, which isn't bad. You know, it's not a bad thing if you don't want it to be a bad thing, but it takes a lot of work for me to break the rules with something that still sounds good. It just takes a lot of extra work. Whereas somebody that is more educated in a sense of just hearing and starting to learn the language and just being like, I don't know what I'm doing, but it sounds good if I go from here to here. Like, I wish I could do that sometimes i really wish that could be me so i feel like we see a lot of people that are very hard-headed uh because they've spent so much time and energy and money really perfecting the craft of a classical education in music but i think at the tail end of every single one of those is man if i could have just gotten creative instantly that would have been cool and also how can more people just be creative and play music because otherwise we're going to lose musicians as we know it in the modern age because mm -hmm. nobody pays attention and nobody wants to put in five years of work, right? Uh, they want immediate satisfaction for sure. And it's possible with things like this. So yeah. my high level rant is that I agree. I wish a lot of times that this stuff existed when I was a youngin, uh, and I could have had the ability to just create and enjoy and start to just associate music and the language of music in my head rather than in books uh, as well. Uh, but that, that's me. So I think we're actually, in my opinion, I think we're, we're, we're in the beginning of a phase shift. And when I say phase shift, uh, phase shift in chemistry, a phase shift is a, you know, a, some matter or something going from one state to another, for example, ice melting, you know, or water go, evaporating. But those shifts, they happen very rapidly, but there's so much energy transfer and there's so much uh, time or in this case, degrees or heat in between those phase shifts where almost nothing happens. So water, like, let's say, you know, if you're uh, used to Fahrenheit, you know, water melts and then it doesn't boil until roughly 200 degrees hotter, right? Nothing happens. So what I think was, is happening right now. And I, I think that people like us are, are, on the very kind of cutting edge cusp of, of being aware of this uh, phenomenon that's happening is that if you look back through the history of music, it's pretty much been the same even when we had cavemen, right? You have a thing or somebody sings, a vocal, a vocal cords are a different instrument, but let's say you have a thing like you play drums or eventually they develop flutes about 60,000 years ago as far as we know. And then, you know, fast forward to the modern day and we still have this traditional system of music, which is, you have an instrument like a guitar or drums or a piano or whatever it is. And you have this traditional method of learning, which, which is a sheet music, you know, classes, that system that it's, it's a, essentially a piece of technology that allows you to learn this language. And now what I think we're seeing is this phase shift where because techno uh, technology in the sense of AR, VR, et cetera, uh, allowing us, allowing us to visualize and literally see things in our brain the way that we couldn't before, I think we're witnessing this phase shift where the learning of the actual language of music is now transferring to this new 
uh, literally this new reality of I'm going to learn this in AR, VR. I, I can see the music. I can see and feel it where it's visual and I can learn how to speak it just like any human learns how to speak their native language. They don't, no single human went to school first before they learn how to speak, right? Everybody speaks first. We use that analogy all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. learn to speak and then develop through that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. 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 So I think we're witnessing that phase shift uh, with music as well. So before we talk about what do we think the future is going to be like, um, number one, Zach, I'd love to hear your comments on that, but I'd also love to hear what is that, the, the challenges of the journey of the tech side? What, what are the challenges along the way of you have this idea, you know, AR and VR in general are kind of starting to take off. What are the challenges along the way from getting to idea, to prototype, to something, to now actually on a, a major marketplace? Okay. A couple of things there. Um, Just like 85. <laughs> um, so the, the, the technical challenges one is really big. To the, to the uh, effect of the, the phase shift portion, I'm, I'm, I'm completely with you. I, I think a lot of it is, uh, I think it's predicated on the assumption that we're spatial computing is here to stay and now is the moment and yeah. we're, people are going to be, it's the next computing device. Maybe phones are going to be going away at some point and like, we're going to be spending hours, many hours a week, potentially many hours a day inside of a face computer. Uh, I don't think that's proven yet. I think that the technology is really impressive and I think having like some of the biggest, most powerful companies in the world betting, not at all, but a lot of, you know, a lot of their future on that is a really strong, mm -hmm. it's a really strong thing to bet with. Um, but assu assuming that's correct, I think for sure, I think like just people like you're, like you were saying before, sheet music is a technology and it worked and it's, really amazing and it was it's been really amazing because it like it did such a good job like transmitting this education over time it's kind of like the written word but in a different but just with music right um and people liked it because it was like the easiest most effective way to achieve their goals right spatial computer people love piano vision because it's like the easiest way to achieve that goal of, of feeling the music come out of your hands and playing uh playing music that you like to hear and having that emotional connection that I'm musicians, classical musicians, I'm sure feel like through that process, they get addicted to it. And you're like, okay, this is, I like, I like how my brain feels when this is happening. So I'm just going to keep doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think assuming spatial computing is happening, that's like, I think it's for sure given, I think it's this phase shift where we can now think, think beyond sheet music and we can think like, I kind of, I think of it as like on a, uh, on like a, a First principles, like core fundamentals, like what are the pixels we can put in front of people's eyes to get them that connection with music and, and with yeah. the instrument. Um, and so just working from there, like the falling note systems are a really good start. Uh, I think I, in that phase shift sense, I think like I, I think a lot about the evolution. I kind of talked about it before, the evolution of the falling notes and how we can embed more musical knowledge into the, like the falling note system mm -hmm. or adapt it and grow it into this way that it's like it's not just like playing notes but having a deeper sense of what's actually happening in the piece and how do we embed that in a way that like really attaches in your brain um so that's that's how i think about that i think like you're like that next like this is that phase shift moment and then it's like okay then it's boiling for a while i think growing in that direction is how that whole process is going to be. Um, to, to, the, to the tech question, what are the challenges? Um, the core, the like the real core functionality of Piano Vision, uh, I did that really quickly. I knew I knew how to do it. Like I, I, it, I knew. Like I just I thought about what I wanted. And I knew how to do it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of like hard tech involved in it. That was just like iterating and figuring out what systems to mesh together and things like that. Sure. But I, think, I think the hardest problem that I face personally is like um, optimal like user experience, mm -hmm. um, just because it's a completely new platform and there are, there's not a lot of best practices. It's like, how do you do this? Especially with, 
a headset that love the Quest 3. I think it's amazing. The Quest 2, I think they're an absolutely amazing platform, but it's like it's buggy and, you know, they're they're developing on the cutting edge. So there's features you try to develop that just they'll break. And that's really <laughs> sucks. And all the all the uh, the calls come to me of like, why is this not working? It's like, well, they've kind of broke something mm-hmm. in the update. That's that's really painful. But VR in general, it has a lot of the, the hardest part in the tech is to like think of it. And seeing, seeing the problems of the Quest platform today is that it is just a very high friction device. It's mm-hmm. lower friction than almost all the devices prior, but it's a very high friction device, um, especially the Quest 2 was like for a while, uh, they did horrible battery management. So people would play, have an experience and then they'd put it away for like three days and they'd pick it back up and it's dead. It's like, okay, well, that action to do it is just gone because they have to go charge it for mm-hmm. 30 minutes to an hour and so like friction is the key minimizing friction for vr ar vr experiences right now is paramount um one one of the things that people really really wanted and we do it really well now is uh anchoring so whenever you put the headset on if you've already calibrated it your keyboard should always be anchored and like for a while that was experimental they didn't like they it was really tough to get that always working right. And there were a lot of edge cases where they, there'd be an upgrade in the, in the device and it would break it. And um, mm. on the platform side, not, on, not, on, not necessarily on the application side. So it's like all of that comes together to this like friction equation, where if the friction is this high, then you're going to lose the user. So I've been working on this since 20, December, 2021. So the core functionality was, I had that, within a couple months, like the core, like following notes, sure. ability to like sync songs and stuff. I've had a lot of like really cool stuff for like, uh, like stats and scaling, the ability to have a huge library and uploads and multiplayer and a ton, ton of stuff like that. But like most of my thought has been, how do I just streamline this experience, minimize friction and make it just feel as good as possible. And it's still, I mean, people still have bugs. There's still bugs and it's still not perfect, but like I just want to make the experience that a person has when they're playing the piano and they're learning. I just want that to feel as good as possible. And that's right. Constantly a challenge. Right. Yeah. It sounds like there's a lot of unforeseen constraints that maybe you run into and friction, I think is the best way to put it. As you said, it actually reminds me of a book. I think it's called the design of ordinary things. Yeah, but yeah, talks, yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Oh, but it, it, yeah. 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 So it just talks about the, 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 the things in daily life that you would never think about, about how they had to design it for normal people to not even have to think about using it. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what you're illustrating here, which is really fascinating. So that's a little bit about the tech side that gives us a good idea as far as like, what are the challenges on your end about kind of like fashioning the peg to fit the hole that that meta gives you right but what about the commercialization side is this something where you had this idea you developed an app you somehow got it on the platform and boom we're here or what what is the step of getting that out to the public Uh, so getting to the public is not that's not the hardest part getting onto the quest store is a really it's a really challenging thing um it's not like uh it's like, okay, it's not horrible. Like there's ways to do it. Mm-hmm. It's hard. I mean, it's hard and you have to like really work hard to do it. Um, but it's not like, okay, your app is of this quality in terms of the experience, in terms of like visuals, there's, you know, there's not like jarring things happening. It's not like you hit this quality bar of an application and then you're just on, you kind of have to prove that you're worth it. Hmm. And so that was, that was a long slog. That was, um, uh, from the moment I started, that was one of the things I was like, okay, this, if we don't do this, if we don't prove to Meta that we're a good application, that people like us, that we're worthy, like, and that's what, you know, they're the only ones around that ha- have actual distribution. Yeah. Um, so that was definitely one of the things I optimized for, optimized for from the start. Um, and you just really, like, you, you really want to make sure that, like, users are you're growing users you're keeping users and you're getting good reviews and that mm-hmm. that kind of tells those are like the rough metrics that tell the picture that build the picture of like okay this is a quality app that people will want to pay money for um sure yeah yeah so it makes that, sense. go ahead ryan no 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 go ahead i've got i've got a new question here so i'll let you reply 
Okay. Yeah. I was just going to say, so you mentioned distribution and is this something where we're kind of talking about a new paradigm in a way, because now we are quote marketing things that are in this new media or new medium of AR VR games, right? Where previously, you know, this is, we're talking about online. Previously we have like in-person stores and you know, how you might market your store or your restaurant or whatever is typical, you know, phone book, uh, signs, billboards, whatever. Then we go to online and how you might market something like online courses or something is like maybe ads or, you know, email lists and all that kind of stuff. And now you're talking about getting in terms of distribution, you said meta is, is, you know, they have distribution. So are you talking about your main marketing strategy? If you could touch on that uh, a little bit, is it, getting on the quest store and hopefully they just have enough distribution and people come our way or is it like a a a legitimate you know plan and effort to well we're going to do this and we're going to have the socials and we're going to do this how does that look um so i i had a team or around launch i had a team help me with how we were going to plan you know to make sure launch was good the holiday season was good and strong. VR is really like, it's very seasonal. When people buy new headsets and when they get new headsets, that's the biggest time. And you'll see it across the board for anyone who posts their stats. Um, so like optimizing for those periods was like really, really important. Um, I didn't know, like we obviously got a, a lot of support from Meta in terms of like commercials and invisibility there. Uh, I had plans for things. I had, I had like, I had an intuition that we were going to get some support because I know I, knew mixed reality was going to be the big push and i i just i love the app and i know other people did so i had a i had a sense that we were going to get some support there i didn't realize how big it was going to be um so i like i had some plans some backup plans if we didn't get support um but for me personally i i had a uh a team or i i I, it was i guess a consulting agency that was helping with the launch stuff but outside of that, I mostly am like, it's pretty, like I, I try to keep it pretty organic. The way that I view it right now, like I'm, I'm definitely still really trying to grow and, and optimize and get new users and things like that. But sure. um, because of our, like the success at launch, I'm, I prioritize like product development. Uh, and I find that the moments that I can, that I drive the company further is when I'm, just hyper focused on like improving the product. And like I was saying before, like we still don't completely for sure know that spatial computing is here to stay Mm -hmm. in this really deep sense. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm planning for the day that we know it is and the day that it actually hits scale to have the best spatial computing platform for like, for that moment. And I mean, mean, that still talks to today, you know, we're still part of that is growing the, you know, growing like a big user base that's really happy with the products and with the growth that we're having. But I, from my perspective, I just think of it as like, how much value does Piano Vision as a product deliver mm-hmm. compared to anyone else and just growing that. And that's what I'm like hyper-focused on. Got it. Yeah, yeah that's good. Um, and it's funny, I, I have so many things, uh, I had so many great jokes along the way and I didn't want to interrupt. So, you know, I'll just say, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll pull one of, uh, you know, you're talking about the updates they push and it instantly made my brain go, I can't even begin to count the amount of times my plugins on WordPress have been broken (laughs) from a WordPress update. I can't even imagine a headset, man. Like I can't even imagine that. Oh man. Uh, so I don't envy that, uh, at all. Like like, I'm not blaming them at all. Like they're, they've pushed they pushed everything forward so much. And like when they, when things break, it's probably because they're developing something crazy cool. And well, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. I mean, same for things like yeah. WordPress and everything. It's just yeah. part of the game. It happens. Yeah. I'm not saying yeah. anything negative either. I'm just like thinking of the fix of being like, what do they say is broke? Hold on. Right. Let me look. Let me see. <laughs> Let me also lift this up and code a little bit to fix it. Put it back right. on. Nah, nah, it's not fixed yet. <laughs> We had one. Oh my god, we had one. We were, it was before we launched, so we like it didn't have as big of an argument. But uh, the best way to play is hooking your MIDI, MIDI keyboard directly into the headset because you get you get mm-hmm. no latency. And they just like they had this big update and it just broke it for everyone. Uh... And so and I had a bunch of users. I had like a, a good amount, and they're all like, "What are we gonna do?" I have a desktop app, but then you got like latency over Wi-Fi, 
And so I like I went to Matt and I was like, we need like this is fundamental. We're launching in a couple months. Like the users are like I need them for the launch to you know help support it. And it took some time. I mean, you know, they worked pretty fast, but it was like at that. And so I think after that, they added like a specific piano vision test case when they're doing the updates to not break that. But it's, right. yeah, it's just it's, like, <laughs> it's so funny. So so yeah. So I mean, we kind of mentioned it. You know, I I. I think I had been already in contact with you when I started paying a lot of attention to the Quest commercials. And I remember sitting with my wife and being like, that's Piano Vision. Like I could see Piano Vision again. And then like the next one, the next break, I'd be like, that's another Piano Vision one, man. Uh, and I was like, I, I, I know this guy. Uh, but also uh, I I started realizing how big uh, it it was in a sense, right? I mean, when we're talking about headsets, I, I think we talk about them all the time uh, on the podcast. We also have to keep in mind that it's not like as many people that own computers yeah. own VR headsets. So sure, the the percentage is much smaller, but it's still a massive indicator as we start to grow and go to the place. And again, you mentioned it before, the fact that Apple has developed something for me is like, oh, yeah. well, then now now it's sealed like now it's more than likely happening uh coming soon the eye contact um but yeah we don't know so for me the question i'd love to have before we open up the real nerdy talk about what happens to music learning in the future is when was that moment that you knew like what you had done like what happened what day was it where you were like oh man Okay, I guess this is a big thing. Like we did really well. All right, what was that moment? There were two. There, I guess there were two. Well, the, the first one was the the moment that I like. There was a moment because there's a lot of things behind the scenes layered into the application. Uh, I, I think the I think like when, to, to me, if I boil it down, the magic of it is like you don't have a you you can just do something you never thought you could do at a much higher level, like kind of immediately. And so I was like, I was adding these layers in of like different things, like gradually highlighting keys as they're coming and just trying to really map to the brain to like ha have that expectation uh, set of, so that you can like anticipate things and whatnot. And there was just this moment where I added, like there's this day I went crazy and I like added like three or four different visuals to it. And it just started to work and I just could start playing better. And that was a moment where I was like, okay, like, I'm just going to keep doing this. Like it's nice. this, there's something here that I've never, ever felt on any other application. So I'm just going to, and that was before I had a ton of users. I think I, like, I think that was actually before I had any users. Yeah. That was before my ever, my first like side quest. Um, so that was, that was the first one where I felt like, okay, I really have something. And then in terms of like, um, like recognition, I guess it was definitely the day that I got, I got uh, the email about, the just the commercials that they were putting out i was like okay this is like we're going to be featured in from october to january on like nfl games and things like that i was like okay like i'm then i was just like combining like a product that i was very 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 proud of i worked like crazy before because I, I got married last year too so the wow. the it was like a big indian wedding multiple day thing too so i had my what was it my my code freeze like the, the last day that i could push code was like uh i think like a couple days like a couple days before my wedding so and i was working like it was crazy i was working like 100 hour weeks just making sure everything was perfect and crisp and and so like the moment they were like okay we're gonna we're gonna show this is we're gonna show it and it's gonna be really big i was like okay i'm really proud of this product you're gonna it's gonna get eyes and distribution people are going to experience it and i was like okay that's that's the the, the one-two punch for me yeah it's not bad uh it's not a bad way to go into a honeymoon either i guess yeah. uh, <laughs> as well <laughs> just being like well uh i'm on the nfl uh but yeah yeah i mean it, it was so quick from the outside not from your point not at all uh but from the outset we had heard about piano vision and we were talking about it together because john and i we just we only made the podcast because we were already talking way too nerdy for hours on end uh but we were already talking about it and i just within a month i, I started seeing your stuff just get massively boosted in the marketplace and for me it was like great work 
on your end and like a great product for sure. But also it really motivated me and made me feel really good about the future of what is to come in music education. Because what does that mean? That means like Meta, a massive company, saw what you were doing and mm -hmm. what they, of course, they're like, this is cool. But I'm pretty sure they focus on like profitability and growth. Uh, right. So them, the reason they saw your stuff and they were like, we got to put it out there. There was probably multiple things. But the one that stood out for me was here are some of the world's biggest visionaries uh, and thinkers that exist now and are essentially creating everything we live in every day. And they're looking at what you've done going, this is potentially like the next thing. Like this mm -hmm. is the direction that we need to go. And that was the first inkling for me, like, wow, okay, that's, if Meta thinks this is where it's going, chances are <laughs> this is where it's going to be going because they make the decisions. Uh, <laughs> but it's true. So for me, it was, it was incredible to see that and to start seeing other companies, tech companies, get in the world of education in music with no boundaries. I think that's the big thing. Uh, just getting people in, creating, having a passion and a love for playing and doing stuff. And sure, if at the end of the day, that's all they want to do is just tinker around, cool, they're satisfied. If they want to go down the road of music theory, sheet music, all that stuff, you served as an inspiration for them to be like, okay, I kind of like this stuff. Let me, mm -hmm. let me go and ascend into the next uh, area. So for me, it was really amazing. But that brings me to probably the biggest part of our conversation. Uh, that we have, which is like, you've done all of this. It's still in process. I get it. You still got to push some updates because it'll break. Uh, but I, I get it. So what happens from here? Like, wh where does music education in general go in your eyes? If you had to predict over the next five years, 10 years, where are we with technology and what we're able to do with music education? I like I... I think about like education is like information transmission. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot about how do we embed that? Like, I think of, yeah, I think of education and good education is one where like a good, like it's not a good education if it's really, really high information, but on the receiver's end, they just, they don't accept it and they don't have retention towards wanting more of that information. Mm -hmm. I think following that pathway of like, really high user engagement and feeling good about receiving the information and just following that pathway and trying to transmit more musical knowledge. And uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not like a music teacher. I, I work with, uh, his name's Benjamin. He's awesome. He like comes up with all of our like musical content and all, all the different ways that we can like teach and do things like that. And he, it's great. We're, we had a really we had like a three hour call last night on all this new stuff we're going to be working on. Uh, I think, I think like I mean, we, we can learn a lot from traditional music education and try to just like adapt that into a transmission that people like receiving, I guess. Mm -hmm. and, and and just fixing. I think I, I think it's a very like it's a, a pretty solvable thing. Just make it interesting and engaging and fun. Um, that's like generally how I see it going. And then turn it like turning that into features, turning that into experiences inside the app that like people respond to and they like want to get more into um it, it's it's really crazy there's it's just being like controlling the features in a prod in a, a product that people use is it gives it's a crazy perspective i've built like app, small apps before but i've never been in this position of like just a small product change like fundamentally changes the way that people like for example we have um it's like a thousand different pieces and like 400 different exercises and the original presentation of it that we got to when we simplified it was just basically like 12 or 13 different levels and uh, like 90 pieces per level. So it's just this big list, right? And it's like, it's daunting. You go through it and you click and you're like, okay, maybe I'm around this and I'll play it. But n now we like narrowed it down to nine pieces to focus on per grade. And I've, got, I've gotten a lot of feedback saying like, I feel myself less wanting to like import my own music and just go random, but actually like work my way through the curated way of like building technique and it's like mm -hmm. things like that like to add into to get people into this pipeline of actually like transmitting the musical knowledge while still being fun is like mm -hmm. that's the general thing that i'm trying to work on but there's a lot of other cool like fun like i'm 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 not like super narrowly focused on just that thing i i, 
I like doing experiments. Uh, I'm working on like some cool research projects right now that are like really, really fun. And, I, and they're going to be valuable in the future. And, and they're also just really fun. Like it's really, it's really <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. It's, it's nothing to do with a hundred hour work weeks before your wedding. Uh, <laughs> it didn't, it didn't happen at all. So yeah, I think one thing I'll touch on that I've thought about for, for many years and you kind of talked about it, uh, spoke on it a little bit. Um, the idea of memorizing versus learning. Yep. And I think that that is where we we don't do so well in, in traditional music education a lot of the time. Uh, for me, memorization is like, here are the notes, here are the chords, here's what that is, remember that, keep yeah. it in there, don't lose it, don't forget yeah. about it, uh, rather than experiencing it yourself and starting to actually retain it through the learning process. And I feel like, you know, there was a time where when I graduated, I went into sales because I didn't make money as a musician. Uh, and I didn't I didn't play for, I'd say, three years, four years. I just gave up. I stopped playing the guitar. And I came back to the guitar after a certain amount of time to get really back into it. And I was like, I don't know what's going on. Like, I just realized over my five years in school that it was just memorization. That's all they were doing to me. It was just mm -hmm. drilling it into my brain. And the moment it was done, I was like, I can't even hear the intervals. I don't even like, I never even studied that stuff. So it really became about the learning process. And I think a lot of what we're seeing in AR, VR is more geared toward learning through the process of unknown learning. So by that, I mean, we we know Virtuoso. We, we've had uh, Virtuoso on here quite a bit. And when you go to play in their environment in Quest, it's you know nothing to do with actual music theory or or education it's all shapes patterns uh, colors and you're just kind of mixing and touching things and you're like oh that sounds kind of cool let's play around with that but subconsciously you're kind of learning things like harmonies chord progressions time signatures you're just not realizing that that's what you're doing until you see it and you're like oh yeah i do that all the time that's fine i've already learned that so for me that's what i see as the key difference to what you're doing it's allowing people to learn that stuff by themselves, retain it without being forced or shown you have to do it this way, you have to do it that way, which then in turn gives them a much more authentic, better experience in music in general. So I think that that's great. Um, the last thing I, I'll really come in with is a bigger question on the future stuff, uh, because we're talking really specific on Piano Vision and what you're going to do there, which is great. Uh, but do you think this is the new trend? By that, I mean, do you think that we're going to be seeing a curve of digital instruments and virtual instruments in things like AR, mixed reality, instead of this surge of physical instruments? Are we going to be seeing people play instruments with their headsets mainly eventually? And, and what is that? How are you feeling towards the idea of like virtual versus physical? I think I... Uh... I don't, I think I wouldn't be surprised if someone, I know Virtuoso, I know those guys, they're great. I think the the cool instruments they have inside are like really neat and interesting. I think that someone could, if we're wearing spatial computers all the time, I think someone could come up with a spatial instrument that's really wild and revolutionary. Uh, I don't, unless we're like really in this like metaverse world, I don't, necessarily think that that'll overtake traditional instruments I, and i think that we'll just see like an augmentation of physical instruments that are already really popular and i think like the like learning with them i think playing with them and then just having that the like an information highway between the person and the instrument i think we'll see a lot more of that mm -hmm. uh just throughout the whole process like i would I, like i'm really at some point, there's going to be someone who does like a piano concert wearing a headset. And I'm just really excited for that day. Yeah. I don't know what it's going to be, but uh, but I think I think there's a lot of the process that's that's going to be aided inside the headset and augmented inside the headset. Virtual instruments, yeah, I like. I'm not so sure. Maybe it, like I think yeah, I think we'd have to spend a lot of time in virtual worlds together, and mm -hmm. then we'd see more of that. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. Good, good. Yeah. And I, I see that as well because, you know, we started with like Quest 2, no pass through really. Uh, so it was fully immersive. 
And now we're kind of at this double tap on the side because I bought one. I know it. Uh, but yeah, the double tap on the side to be able to like be in a virtual environment or just in your house. So it's almost like we went from let's create these massive worlds and let's live within them in the headset and that's it. And now like we're going into this secondary iteration, which is like, yeah, but just kidding. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> if you don't like to do that, that that's, you could be in your house. It's no big deal. <laughs> So it's almost like we're seeing a realization of like, yeah, th maybe that's the ultimate goal, but maybe we need to kind of like hybrid the two uh, for now and then really create environments that they could utilize um, with that. So, yeah, I can hear you there. But, John, I'd love to hear your thoughts, too. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Zach, I like that you as a person who is, let's call it bullish on this whole idea of, of mixed reality and you're developing this new thing. And you, you have been for a long time, right? I like actually that you kind of have a more practical view on Ryan's question as far as, well, are we going to go completely uh, virtual instruments and all that kind of stuff? Uh, because it, it's it's practical, I think. But I also think along the same lines, I think that's I think what we're going to see is kind of a bell curve where the peak of the bell curve is mixed. It's whatever is the most practical version of virtual versus traditional. And then on the fat tails, on the edges, um, we're going to see some people, a majority, I mean, excuse me, a minority, a niche that's all virtual. And then in the other niche, that's all traditional, yeah. right? I think that's how it's going to settle out. Yeah. Is that, if you see, I, I wouldn't be, I don't, I don't expect it in the very near term, but if someone comes up with like a really amazing virtual instrument, that just like, I think, I think it's going to be like whatever, you know, someone makes that makes people feel good. Like if yeah. someone makes this virtual instrument that like, Every other instrument, every other musician who plays other instruments just gets in and they're like, I can just be so expressive and it just is amazing. Then like that might have a chance. You know, that just takes some some genius that's creative and figures this thing out that is amazing. It um, could be. I wouldn't discount it. I just I don't know the timeline. It would just sure. that's just one of those like black swan events that's like, wow, OK, paradigm shift, you know? Sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll wait to see that one. But I, I kind of see it like ice cream. So everybody likes different flavors of ice cream. Some people okay, like that. Okay, wait, wait. I, I just got to warn you, Zach. Every analogy is ice cream. All right? <laughs> this man loves ice cream so much. All right, Who doesn't? <laughs> uh, who doesn't? But no, what, what I was saying is, you know, people like different flavors of ice cream. And just because maybe you like chocolate doesn't mean you'll never eat vanilla or whatever, you know, strawberry, whatever. So I think even if somebody did, and I, I would love to be proven wrong, even if somebody did come out with the super califragilistic X, like super amazing, whatever instrument that just kills all the other instruments, I still think people will be like, yeah, but I like the saxophone. I want to pick it up. You right. know, I like the feeling of it. I like the drums. I like whatever. Right. So ultimately at the end of the day, and this can kind of, you know, lead us to the conclusion here. I love what you said. And we, we agree. It's about how it makes you feel. And that's what people are looking for. It's all about expression. I mean, we always say that since the very beginning of this podcast, you mentioned first principles, a first principle assumption of this podcast is that we all have music inside of us and we all want to be able to express that in some way. I mean, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the top is self-actualization, which means yep. all people are looking to express whatever is in their inner self, whatever that means there, every human is looking to express that, right? So what you're doing is allowing them to do that. What we're doing is helping to allow them to do that as well. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's about having fun and feeling the way you want to feel. And I think that's, exactly. that's where all this leads. Totally. I love that. That's exactly how I feel about it. And yeah, like, like I guess we're, we're both in positions where we get to like try to drive that and help people have that better experience with it. And it's a, a very, I consider myself very fortunate to be in that position to, to get to help people like that. Absolutely. I mean, did you ever imagine before, and maybe you did because that's why we're here right now, but did, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago when we were kids, did we ever think about, hey, we're going to be having a conversation about how we're on the forefront of changing how the language of music is learned in through technology. Like, that's so cool. Right. I just I just wanted to watch Secret of the Ooze, bro. That's all I wanted. <laughs> uh, that was it, man. But yeah, yeah, no, it's it is the reason we we started this and we wanted to connect with with people like yourself. Um, you know, we we want to make sure that we're we're not just talking with just anybody. Um, yeah. ultimately our entire mission is that we want more people to be able to pick up an instrument and get what's in there out and, uh, relive those moments where like, I don't know, I don't know, I you know, traditional classical musician, but there are times where, you know, I'll play a single chord and like cry 
like that stuff. Like, how do we bridge the gap to to connect everybody uh, right. to that ability? And that's that's the really cool stuff. So I got to say, really one. Cool, yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we love what that. you're doing. We love what you're doing, man. So, I mean, it's incredible work over there. Uh, yeah. I'm sure it doesn't keep you busy at all. I'm sure it's <laughs> just set and forget at this point. Um, but yeah, set it. And uh, but anyway, uh, you're you're doing incredible stuff. I've got the Thanks. the Quest Three. Uh, I'm going to show this clip to my wife so she knows that you're the reason I bought it, not my own stupidity. Uh, <laughs> and and we'll go from there. But. Uh, incredible work we love to see the success you're you're seeing there and i guess the only big ask i have is for anybody that's listening and is kind of like eh, maybe i'm interested in trying it out maybe i want to give it give it a try um what what would you say to them how would you convince them to get on the platform and give it a try it feels really good just give it a shot like just go in go to level zero and just play the first piece and try one hand if you can't do uh can't do two and just feel it it feels good i like i that's i think i worked on that's the core piece the core mechanic i just it just feels good and we have a lot of content that you can try out you can upload whatever you want so just try it like it just it feels good i'm going to uh request that you remove all copy from your website and the only <laughs> quote that's on the top is it just feels good <laughs> just feels good <laughs> it just feels good download now. your t-shirt <laughs> It just feels good. Download now. Isn't there more on this website? What the heck? What am I doing? It's just just eight different testimonials, all the same quote. It's just, it just sure does. Good. Yeah, love it. Feels it good. feels pretty good. Uh, but anyway, no, it does. Uh, and we really appreciate you being here, man. And yeah, we appreciate what you're doing for everybody uh, in, in the music education space and beyond. And I can't wait to see where you guys go. Because again, you said what? You started building this in 2021? Is that yeah, what I yeah. heard? Pretty much the beginning of 2022. I, I, so two years. Yep, two years. So two years. And you've gone from nothing uh, to a, a complete environment and augmented reality on educating people to play piano, even though you're not even originally a pianist. Uh, hey, like, like you know, work. It's a small team, but we got we got a lot of people. Or we got a couple people that are like they're really really talented. Like, oh sure, yeah yeah. Oh, I imagine. I'm just saying the fact that you took something from this much of an idea to what it is now in two years. I two more years. I can't even imagine. Uh, to, I'm still working two hard. It's not it, more it's months. Not the pre-launch days, but it's still. I'm working. I'm working pretty hard still. I can. I, I don't want to know. I mean, that is uh, that's probably way too insane for my brain to comprehend. I got games to play. All right. What are you what are you trying to do here? Make me work. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Uh, thank you for being on. Uh, and Absolutely. as always, thanks everybody for watching, for listening, for following all of that stuff. We'll make sure all of your links and everything are in the show notes and description so people can dive in and take a look. I appreciate you, John. I appreciate you, of course, Zach. And Thanks so much to everybody for listening to the Future of Music podcast.